On this episode, I'm joined by Chase Parsons, professional walleye angler, co-host of the Next Bite TV show. Chase gives us some great ideas and advice on how to troll lead core line for walleyes. And we have just a really good general walleye discussion. And he gives us some hints on public speaking, what to expect, and the confidence on doing so. So come on in and join us. All right, I'd like to welcome in Chase Parsons to Get Bit Outdoors. How you doing? Doing well, man. Appreciate you having me. You betcha. Like I said, I appreciate you taking the time out. I know you guys are busy recording shows, fishing tournaments, and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, surprisingly, our, our tournament season's over. The, the Bell's NWT got over a little bit early this year. The championship was early August, so it's uh, on to finishing up all the TV work, which, uh, of course, uh, you know, Dad, Keith, and I, we tend to procrastinate a little bit sometimes and we got a lot of work to do this fall <laughs> do you yeah lots of work <laughs> um <laughs> i think i have to i have to host three or four shows yet and then we have to do all the tip segments so um you know we'll be fishing for for quite a while yet over here gotcha so give everybody a little background on on you and how you got into the business and and all that kind of good stuff yeah i mean uh i mean i i, I guess to say uh you know, I grew up in the right family is probably an understatement when it comes to walleye fishing. Um, you know, Gary Parsons is my father, and, and Keith Cavias is my uncle. And, uh, and as far as walleye tournaments have been around, you know, since um, I want to say the first so-called professional ones they fished were back in 84, I believe. Um, and I was born in 83. So, <laughs> um, so you know, I've been around tournaments and uh, professional walleye tournaments pretty much my whole life, um, and uh, and just kind of uh, learned as I went. I mean, I did a lot of pre-fishing with those guys when I was younger, grade school, uh, even in early in high school, um, and then uh, pretty much when I realized I wasn't going to be a professional athlete, and a lot of that's probably because I'm five nine and uh, not really great at much else other than fishing. Uh, <laughs> I, I figured that uh, I was never the type of person who wanted to sit behind the desk, and uh, and I had two of the best teachers that I could ever have. So really from there it was, uh, you know, I entered some tournaments. Uh, I started doing this full-time professionally when I was 19 years old. Nice. Uh, which seems like an eternity ago. I mean, that was 13 years ago now. Um, and had some good success right away. And, and from there, it just went into, you know, public speaking engagements and things like that. And, and basically, the real business part of, of being a professional walleye angler, I guess, um, you know, fishing is our downtime. Uh, the promotions and the public speaking and things like that are, are, are really key. And, uh, and I, I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants, honestly, when I was young. I mean, um, I was one of those kids in high school that was nervous when, when I get up in front of class and give speeches and, and now it's, uh, you know, for quite a few years now, it's been second nature. Um, you, you gotta be able to talk in front of people and, uh, and I've had a great time doing it. I mean, it's been a lot of fun and, and quite frankly, I hope I can continue to do it until I'm, uh, you know, as old, if not older than what dad and Keith are now. So it's been a lot of fun, man. Well, it's been fun following you and, you know, I've watched the next bite since it came out and, it's like I told your dad and Keith when I interviewed them. I've followed them since I was probably 13, 12, 13, and really got into the walleye fishing and reading their articles and, you know, any little tidbit I could catch when they were on TV, you know, I'd watch that. And uh, So it's been really cool to watch you guys develop, you know, watch you develop too because you're, you're a little younger than I am, but, you know, it, it's really cool to see how somebody develops in that business. Yeah, I, I mean it's uh, it's one of the businesses that that a lot of people um, that don't follow it relatively closely don't necessarily understand. I mean, um, you know, people that I meet when I tell them I'm a professional walleye angler, uh, right away they always think that I'm a guide, and and really none of the three of us actually guide. Um, we we came up through obviously the tournament. Uh, end of things and um, and the promotional end of things. So it's been fun. I've had great teachers, um, and, uh, and and the cool thing is now I've gotten to the point where I'm comfortable enough with doing everything. And it, this was probably about eight nine years ago when I got to this point where 
where now I get to actually just host shows by myself and, and I understand what we need to do and things like that. So, um, you know, early on in the, in my career, uh, no doubt those two helped me. They helped me try to get better at public speaking. But I think, you know, when you mentioned reading their articles from way back in the day, I mean, I think that's the key thing with, with all three of us and with a lot of the people that have success in this industry is is we're willing to talk about how we catch fish everywhere and, and, and more so try to teach people how to catch more fish. And, and that's the key. I mean, I think with tournament anglers especially, and, and there is obviously secretive, secretism in, in tournaments, but, uh, you know, if we go out and win a, a tournament on a new technique, um, you know, sure, we could keep it secret and probably win a bunch of money doing it in other places, but but to be able to be a promotional angler, uh, you, you can't do that. So it's, uh, like I said, uh, I mean, I'll probably say it a few more times, those two guys uh, taught me how we feel like the right way to do it is, and uh, and it's been fun. And I turned 33 here in about three days, and, um, you know, I feel like, I'm definitely a veteran in the industry because there's a lot of people who, uh, who you know, haven't made it 13, 14 years and, and have sure tried. Um, but uh, but no doubt, uh, you know, I, I've learned it right. And, and quite frankly, uh, you know, one of my goals is to help some of the younger guys. I mean, guys like Corey Sprangle, he's one of my best friends. He's also one of the best wild anglers on this planet. Um you know, I try to help some of the younger guys and, and try to kind of teach them the way I came up, and and hopefully that helps out and get some of the young guys on the show too because it's it's cool to have some 25-year-old sticks that have different thoughts, and I could say 25 now, but I, I can't even remember when I was 25. <laughs> no uh, doubt. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just a little bit different. You know, you have Dan and Keith who wild anglers have followed forever, and and then I came uh, quite a few later, years later, and, and now we're just trying to get some more young blood even yet. So it's, sure. uh, it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun shooting the shows, a lot of fun going out and uh, hanging out with all the guys at tournaments. Well, and it's pretty cool, too, because, like, on my end, you know, I obviously I'm not any level where you guys are, but to be able to talk to you guys and get the perspective, even in age difference, whether it be your dad, you, uh, I did an interview with uh, Joe Okada here a couple sure. weeks ago. Joey, yeah, he's a great friend of mine, too. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, it's really cool to be able to hear your guys' experience, you know, how you go about doing things, uh, you know, how you learned what you did. And, you know, that's that's what I look at it on my end is the fact that I'm by far no experts or anything, but I like to bring those people on and hear what they have to say. And that's, I mean, I've learned so much just in the two months I've been doing this. Yeah, sure. Well, and, and the one thing that you'll, that you'll see uh, is with all the guys that are successful, we're all okay with taking our lumps. And what I mean by that is there are tournaments right now and, and this year, uh, you know, a few, a few of us, a few guys that I would consider some of the best wall anglers I know struggled in tournaments. And that's, that's the beauty about fishing is when you think you know everything there is to know about fishing, you learn something else the next day. And, um, you know, the rest of my life, I'll fish hundreds of tournaments, and I'll do really well in some, but uh, I'll get beat up pretty bad in other ones. And, and I think that the guys that can really learn in those situations where they do terrible, quite frankly, whether it's a, a weather change or or uh, they just totally missed the bite that they needed to be on. Um, those are where the, the anglers end up having longevity. They can figure out bites as things go to, go on and just kind of look back at experiences and, and kind of put it all together. So by no means are we experts every single day. That's one of the main questions I always get from people at seminars and stuff. Do you always catch fish every day you go out? And uh, for any of us to say yes, we'd be lying, absolutely lying. There's days that we zero. Um, it happens, but uh, that's, uh, that's why I love fishing. It's always a challenge, and uh, you know, I always like to say that uh, wild anglers, um, 
have the toughest job because walleyes change from day to day, and you can catch them in one feet, one foot of water. You can catch them down in eighty feet of water. So sure, pretty cool fish and a uh, pretty cool way to make a living. That's for sure. Oh yeah, well it can humble you real quick. I mean, we've done yeah. our tournament trail that we have here. We've been fishing it since ninety, well ninety three, I think. My dad and I, sure. and you know, there's times where, well, like this last one, we had our championship. Uh, it was mid August and went out and pre-fished and did pretty good uh it was the a week before the tournament and thought we kind of had them figured out and they'd completely changed from what what we had you know nailed down and we go yeah. back out opening day and i mean we could not buy a fish yeah and you know it took us until the end of that first day to go okay well let's go figure something else out and we had a good sunday but you know it still wasn't good enough so yeah, I mean, and, and like I said, that's one of the things. I think anglers that, uh, you know, pre-fishing obviously is important. You can get some spots, you can get an idea of what's going on. But so many times, and it seems like Mother Nature is pretty classic for this, is you get a total change of weather the night before a tournament or the day before a tournament. And uh, and a lot of times your pre-fishing goes right out the window. So that's... Uh, that's kind of what makes it fun, quite honestly. When the bike gets tough, uh, quite frankly, the three of us, especially, we, we, we enjoy when the bite's really tough for a tournament. Um, when we go out to Lake Erie and everyone's trolling around in, you know, groups of 60 boats and 50 boats and the guy who catches nine pounders instead of eight and a half pounders wins, um, those are fun, don't get me wrong, but the bites where you got to fight for five bites a day um are are the bites that we really enjoy and uh we like to catch fish don't get me wrong but when money's on the line i i quite frankly would prefer for the bite to be pretty tough yeah yeah well that makes sense i mean it's going to be it's kind of funny because my dad will say well you know if we're struggling you know probably everybody else is struggling and i tell him you know what there's always somebody that puts it together there's always someone that catches them yeah (laughs) always always you're right about that (laughs) <laughs> it never seems to fail. You think, okay, well, if we've got one or two fish or we're really struggling, hopefully everybody else is, but you come into weigh-in and somebody brings in a big stringer and you're like, gosh, dang it. Yep. <laughs> yep. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So I want to go back real quick with, to something you were talking about, and that's your public speaking. Sure. Um, you know, this... This sense of media here with, you know, the podcasting, it's pretty simple because, you know, you're not in front of anybody. You're talking one-on-one usually with somebody and try to keep it a pretty relaxed environment. But that is one thing that I've always struggled with a little bit is actually public speaking. You know, I've gotten better with it, but what do you give advice to somebody that's really trying to get into that or that has an issue with it? Yeah, I mean, quite frankly, with with doing it the way that that anglers have to do it, um, you know, and, and anglers give a variety of different seminars. You can have PowerPoints in some situations. You can have um, just a rod and reel in your hand. It kind of depends on the setup and, and really uh, how many people are going to be in front of you. But the one thing that, that I really focused on real early in my career to get comfortable with it is is I would try to pick out, if I'm going to talk, you know, most of my seminars happen to be, like, technique-related. Maybe I'll talk about uh, pulling lead core. Maybe I'll talk about uh, open water fishing. I would try to do as many seminars as I could on the techniques or the things that I knew absolutely the best. Um, you know, things that you really feel like you're comfortable talking about are the things that I would really focus in on at first. Now, you're going to get questions about everything else, but but the more you can just get out there and, and, and do them, and quite frankly, some of the things that you can do is go talk to little local clubs, fishing clubs, things like that. Uh, do some seminars on a smaller scale, I think. will just get you more comfortable with it. Um, and, and then secondly, if you do have the, the situation where you can have some type of PowerPoint or, or uh, you know, some type of slide situation, I, I think is really key because it keeps you uh, keeps you on track. It keeps you in line with what you really want to talk about. Um, but quite frankly, it's getting out there and doing it. 
Um, I didn't take any classes. I've, I, I've got to be honest, I probably should have real early on when I was 19, 20 years old. But there's nothing in public speaking that will make someone more comfortable than just practicing it. And the one thing that, that all anglers have to realize, if they're a little bit nervous when they're up in front of people talking about fishing, and, and I still have this happen to the day, is I'll be talking about a technique, and let's just say, for instance, pulling slow death. And, and you're always going to get a handful of anglers in each seminar you give that might be sitting there looking at you like you have no idea what you're talking about. And it's, it, it's like clockwork. And they'll say, well, I don't do it that way. I do it this way. It works a lot better. And, and the truth of the matter is, with fishing, there is not a right and wrong answer. All you can do to people is talk to them about your experiences and what works for you. Um, and, and I always say it in my, in, in my seminars as well, too. Someone will, someone will say, hey, what's the best color crankbait out there? What's the best color flicker shed I should run? And, and it kind of relates back to any type of technique. And I always say, if I knew what the best color crankbait was to run, I wouldn't be up here talking to you right now because I'd be retired at 33. <laughs> no and, and that's the truth. That is the absolute truth. You're never absolutely right when you talk about fishing, but you're also not wrong, and that's the thing that you always have to remember. Um, and I think the thing that is kind of a quick little funny story is when I was about 20 years old, I was still pretty nervous, and I was given a seminar, and I had an older gentleman sitting in the front row right in front of me, and it was at a Bass Pro Shop store, and there were a lot of people. And everything I said, he looked at me and shook his head no. Didn't say anything, but literally, he, he must have done it a hundred times in the seminar, and I couldn't take my eyes off him. <laughs> that hurts. And at, the, you know, and at the end of the seminar, he said, you know, comes up and he's like, well, I've been doing it this way forever, I've been doing it this way forever. And when I said to him, hey, I'm like, I bet, I bet you've caught thousands of walleyes in your life. And I said, and you will continue to catch them, but I, th- these are the things that work best for me. And the things that work best for a lot of the guys who do it for a living. So it's about being comfortable with yourself, talking about what you think the best way is to do it, but not necessarily making sure that you don't tell them it's the only way to do it. Sure. And I think if you get to the point where you can do that, uh, public speaking is a breeze. It's very simple. Um, and, and, and that's really the key, I think. Well, you know, it seems like a lot of times, because I've done a couple of them locally, and what I've found, too, is that it seems like there's two types of people that show up to those. One that's really there to learn and to take in what you're talking about. And then there's one that's there to prove you wrong and to say, like you said, that their way is the best way to do it. Yep. And that's where it gets rough because, you know, you really want to talk to the people that are there to learn. But then it's rough when you got somebody, like you said, that's sitting there <laughs> trying to contradict everything you say. Yeah, it- it's just getting used to it, and, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is the way I always viewed people that maybe didn't think you were saying the right things is at some point in time, and this is where credibility comes in in this industry, I don't get up and talk in, in front of people um, about things I don't believe in. Sure. There is not a logo on my tournament jersey with products that I don't believe in. And if you get up there and just start spewing stuff because there's a logo on your jersey, if you don't believe it, and those people, maybe that one person that doesn't think you know what you're talking about goes out and tries it and then he doesn't catch fish, you've totally lost that angler. So I always really try to talk about the things I believe in that I think on many bodies of water will catch fish. So if I can maybe convince that guy out of the 30 different things I talk about, to try one of the things and it works for him, it's instantly going to change his viewpoint on what I just said. And I think that's always the key. And I, I'm way past the, the, you know, I've done so many hundreds of seminars now that I'm way past that part, but you're never going to please everyone. And that is an absolute <laughs> fact. Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good information. I appreciate that. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. So I got to ask you a question. I was doing some some reading on an article that you were in. Oh, well, it was a long time ago. But did you ever replace the Daiwa setup that went for a swim? Oh, that 
that was a long time ago. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, no, I, I I mean, when that happened, I, uh, you know, the only thing I owned was, I don't know, the pants and the shirt that my parents <laughs> bought me. Right. <laughs> no, that, that was pretty funny, though. I mean, that was one of the first times I ever went fishing with Dad, and you know, he and Keith were newly sponsored by Daiwa way back in the day, and he handed me a rod. Yeah, I mean, it was brand new, absolutely brand new. He tried to hand me a rod to... Like I was just putting it in the rod holder, and I dropped it right overboard. And he'll never let me forget it. But trust <laughs> me, in, in all the years that he's been in my boat, or I've been around him, he's done uh, he's done things a lot. Uh, let's just say dumber than that before. <laughs> well, you know, and it happened. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it's all fun and games. I mean, sure. the three of us we're family, but we have we have a good time, and we. We get on each other quite a bit. Uh, it keeps everything pretty interesting every summer. Well, and that's what I was going to ask you. What was it like growing up with those two? Yeah, it, it, it's fun. You know, um, they're absolutely two of my best friends. Uh, always have been. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I would say that Dad is the quiet one. Keith and I are more of the guys that uh, uh, are, are kind of mouthy, and we kind of jaw jack back and forth a little bit. Um, and then our, our fourth guy, Tom Kimos, another phenomenal angler, travels mm-hmm. with us. He's my roommate. Um, he's been one of my best friends for many, many years. Uh, we fit very well together. We, uh, we're all huge Packer fans, <laughs> number one. Uh-oh. Uh, yep, yep. <laughs> so, um, so we have fun. Uh, we, we just have a lot of fun on the road together, and I, I think our fishing, um, you know, uh, positives and negatives, really blend together well um but just a fun time with those guys i mean there's there's not a single tournament where i go out there and we don't have a ton of fun i mean you know at night we'll talk about fishing but uh you know we sit down and uh and keith and i it's almost like we have a little bit of a battle each day we share information and stuff like that but uh you know each day we, we we like to be the guy who figured out the bite and it keeps everything a lot of fun, um, and those guys have those guys have basically given me the ability to to do what I love to do right now. So um, they'll always be two of my best friends, and uh, it's it's pretty funny because when I was really young, uh, really diehard walleye anglers around here would always be like, "Oh man, I can't believe your dad's Gary Parsons and Keith Cavias." And my comments always used to be. What are you talking about? They're just fishermen. But that was when I was at the point where I loved basketball. I liked golf more. I liked all these other sports more. And um, and quite frankly, the thing that uh, they've taught me the most and, and where now I see that I have the most respect, without a doubt for those guys, is just how hard they work. Sure. Um, yeah, we have off time, but, uh, but with promotions and all these things, uh, we work very hard when when we're on the road as well too. So well, and it seems. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, that's that's about it, man. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> I'm much covered. Or <laughs> well, it seems like your guys' atmosphere on your show, and that's what makes it so entertaining. For I know a lot of people that watch it is the chemistry that you guys have. I mean, obviously, you know, you're working with your dad, which has got to be cool, and your uncle, but just the chemistry you guys show on the on film. That's what I yeah, like. I mean, Exactly, and that's one of the things, uh, you know, and we've, our website will get, you know, two or three emails a year about people saying, oh, you guys are laughing about nothing, you're laughing about nothing. And quite frankly, um, for people that know us, that's how we are in the boat every day. Uh, we have a great time. Um, it doesn't matter if we're catching 14-inch fish or we're catching 9-pound fish. It does not matter. Um we're just we we all realize how lucky we are to do what we do um so yeah i mean we're gonna laugh and have a lot of fun so the the chemistry's always been good between the three of us and and we like to throw jabs in there quite a bit back and forth and what you don't see behind the scenes and maybe a show that you know two of the three of us shoot together is there's always a little bit of uh you know gambling going on on the backside. who gets the biggest fish who gets the first fish nice um you know, we do all the things that everyone else does when they go fishing. Um, unfortunately, we just can't show that stuff. Right. But, uh, but it keeps it interesting, and it keeps it a lot of fun. So we, we do that stuff all the time. So it's uh, 
I'd like to say that uh, I'm way up in money on those guys, but uh, that's probably not the case. Um, but Keith and I, especially, we uh, we go after each other pretty pretty good sometimes, and it, it keeps it fun. Well, good. Well, don't change anything because that's what makes it fun. That's what I like about it. <laughs> well, we won't. <laughs> Um, you know, going back to what you were talking about as far as being younger, you know, playing basketball, and I was having a conversation uh, with a gal here I did an interview with, and we were talking about, you know, getting kids in the outdoors and whatnot. And, you know, we were talking about, because I know from my perspective, when I was younger in, in junior high and high school, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I had sports, I had other things. I mean, yeah, I did the fishing and the hunting, but, you know, you kind of lose those guys for a little bit. And then they always seem to come back to you once they get to be about 18, 19 years old. And then they realize, oh, okay, that stuff is pretty fun. It's pretty cool. So that's just when you were talking about, you know, when you were yeah. playing sports and, you know, you were kind of out yeah. of it and somebody would ask you who your dad was. Well, it's just Gary yeah, Parson. It, it, exactly. I mean, and I think that's the one thing. I mean, there's so many, you know, NPAA now has so many different kids' events and all these circuits run different kids' events. And I... I, I think it's absolutely fantastic, and and that that for sure is the one thing that I think uh, you know the industry is always going to be tough to overcome is is just the fact um, of in the uh, junior high and high school days it's so easy to go to a different sport or things like that. But you're right. I, I mean, when a lot of people say that there's no young people that are interested in the outdoors, I mean you you see it all the time online. Um, it's totally false. And I think with some of these bass, you know, these high school bass teams and, and college bass teams and things like that are doing is just bringing more awareness and you actually see how many kids are interested in it. And, yeah. and quite frankly, I would love to see stuff like that start happening in walleye. Sure. Um, because there's plenty, of, I mean, there are a lot of younger, um, and I wouldn't even necessarily call them kids, just younger people. You know, in this area, in every area that we go, that love to fish, and um, you know, it's going the right direction, um, and and hopefully the industry just keeps going that way, and and we continue to get more young people involved. Um, so, you know, the next person, you know, maybe the next person that's 15 years old right now, will come in like Corey Springle did and win like five events in like five years, um, it, it, and that's that's always the hope of it. Uh, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for doing everything I can to try to get as many young people involved. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's important. I mean, even if you show them and you lose them for a little bit, they'll come back. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. No doubt about it. So was that question I got for you? Was golf ever on the table as a career? Uh, golf was, yeah. I, uh, you know, right, right after high school, I went out to San Diego and, uh, and I used to play golf seven times a week um, and played in some mini tour events uh, back in the day and, and was thinking about the possibility of going um, to be like a, a head pro at a golf course and playing some mini tour events. And right away when I was 19, I started having shoulder issues already. And really the kicker for me was um, I, I gave my first lesson and uh, it, it, as great as she was, it was an older lady and, uh, and and she was not so great at golf, we'll just say that. And and she kept asking me what she was doing wrong, and I thought to myself, holy cow, like, I don't know if I could do this for the next 40 <laughs> years of my life. Because, uh, you know, I know what I wanted to tell her, but I re kind of realized I was start starting to go the wrong route, and really I wanted to be more in the competition and the golf and and I, I probably right now, I still play a little bit. I probably right now could be playing in a lower echelon tour, but uh, but I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing now. Um, I still love, still love the game of golf, but uh, it's uh, pretty much now it's a time to get in some scrambles with some buddies, and, and that's, that's about all the golf end of things is for me now. <laughs> yeah, but that's okay. It's still just a getaway, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely is. I mean, uh you know, three falls ago, I won a car with a hole in one. So oh, that was, nice. That was, yeah, but uh, it, it's a getaway, like you said. Uh, you know, that's one of the things I get asked all the time is, God, you must fish when you're home all the time. And and I fish so much and talk about fishing so much all year long that when I'm home, uh, you know, I have two young boys. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, I want to spend time with my family. 
and uh, and you know for two three days uh, get away from fishing and and that's kind of where golf falls in for me golf and hunting of course but uh, sure but yeah I mean I uh, you know I fish a ton I fish a lot more than ninety nine point nine percent of those people can do um, and I'm grateful for that but uh, but you also need to uh, keep the home front uh, well when you're gone as much as what we are and that's that's just balancing everything quite frankly heck yeah. Well, I know you said you're you're uh, hunting now. You still have your vislas? Yeah, have I uh, have my two vislas? They're both about ten years old, and uh, I also have a uh, seven month old German short hair pointer right now too. That's just an absolute maniac. So, um, you know, we don't have much for live birds around this area by Green Bay, but uh, I'm gonna get a package of pheasants at a game farm here and. And do some haunting with them uh, this fall when uh, when I finally get done with uh, w- with the fishing tips and the <laughs> fishing shows and things like that. I'm actually headed uh, on Saturday here uh, to do a musky shoot up on the Chippewa Flowage with uh, with two good friends. So you do a little bit of musky fishing. Uh, quite frankly, I'll be honest, I, I don't musky fish much at all. Um, but that's what I have two uh, two really good anglers coming to shoot the show with me for. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun, other than the fact that I have a feeling my arms are going to be dead from throwing cowgirls around for three days. Oh, I bet, I bet. That's not going to do the shoulder any good, is it? <laughs> yeah, so it'll be fun. Oh, heck yeah, it will be. You know, that's kind of interesting because we don't have anything that's native as far as muskies go, but they did start here, well, when I was working with the Department of Wildlife about 15 years ago, we started up the tiger muskie program. And so we've actually got some, I think there's probably six lakes now in the state of Washington that have them. And we've got some in there. I think our state record was just broke last year with a 54 inch, I I believe. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got some, we've got some pigs out there and we've been doing quite a bit of that here lately, but, uh, you know, that's like you said, man, that's a lot of work. Yeah, uh, I agree. It's, uh, I've just never been the type of angler, quite frankly, that, um, you know, can, can cast something all day long. And if you just see one, just see one, you think you had a good day. Yeah. And it, it, that, that's just not my style. It's not <laughs> how I grew up. Not to take any shots at the, I mean, some of my good buddies absolutely love muskie fishing more than walleye fishing, and I'm fine with that. Uh, we definitely need diehard muskie anglers, too. I just don't happen to be one of them. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so, but uh, but it's fun. I mean, I've caught some big ones in my life, and uh, you know, you still get pretty excited when you see those big things come in and, and destroy a lure. So, oh heck I'm yeah, looking forward to it. Should be a lot of fun this weekend. And uh, you know, the the one thing I did say is a shoot. We're starting a shoot on Sunday, which is opening season for the Packers. So I already. Ouch. Let it be known to my buddy that from noon until three o'clock, there's no possible way that we're <laughs> going to be on the water. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that because you know we're our uh, elk opener is Saturday. Sure. So, and of course the Hawks, you know that's my team. Yeah. And you know we we usually take a break that Sunday. We got to run into town and at least watch the game. So yep. I always tell them, say, look, you know, anybody want to go? Get in the back because we're going to town. <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'd, you know, I've missed I've missed Packer games for tournaments and stuff, but uh, I have four days set aside for this musky shoot, and there's no possible way I'm missing those. So how did your tournament season go this year? Tournament season went, uh, I, I would say it was a mediocre tournament season for me. Um, ended up 16th overall in Angler of the Year uh, for the NWT. Which wasn't too bad. I mean, we had record highs for boat numbers. I think we averaged 140 boats per per tournament. Um, so it, it was just it was one of those years where I fished well, um, but I didn't. I, I had some things go wrong, missed fish right by the boat, things like that. That that kind of kept me away from taking the top five overall uh, in angler of the year. So um, decent. We had some good locations. Um, but definitely looking forward to next year. I mean, uh, obviously I think the goal for, for a lot of us that do this is always to try to tend to be in the top 10 for angler of the year. And, and quite frankly, I missed it by about one fish this year. So, really? so yeah, so, so a decent year, um, 
You know, and, and one of the things, too, you always kind of look at being in the running, but at least having a shot at winning one of them. And, and it, quite honestly, I, I wasn't right there for an opportunity to win one of them. So uh, kind of just washing my hands clean of this season, going to shoot some fun shows this fall and, and get ready to go after it next year again. Uh, I'm hearing rumors about the schedule and, and everything's looking pretty good and and hopefully can get uh, in contention to win a few of them for sure. Sure. Well, that's, that's good. I mean, I kind of tried to keep track on you guys as far as how you were doing this year, but, you know, between trying to keep track of that and then fishing my own tournaments and worrying about yeah. that, it's like... <laughs> it's, tough. <laughs> it's tough. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of different events going on. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, not this past year here, but uh, the two years before that, uh, the old man and Keith uh, kind of put a hurting on me. I uh, I had back to back probably my roughest two years since I've done this, uh, three uh, two years and three years ago. Um, but then I got them. I, I I had a I had a better year than they did this year. So uh, <laughs> so I you know it's just baby steps. It's getting back to where where I expect to be um, in the top ten for sure. I mean I've been second in angler of the year twice. Have not won it. Um, it's a very tough thing to do, though, but, uh, you know, that's always the goal. Um, You'll get it. You know, I, I guess if you could say what one of my goals is, is I hope by the time I'm 35 years old, I have an Angler of the Year title. And, and if another tournament win or two come in that time frame, that's great, but I think we all strive for that Angler of the Year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, that's something that they've done with our tournament trail here is they finally went ahead and went with the true Angler of the Year, which makes sure. it nice. Um, yep. You know, uh, we've come somewhat close, but it's been difficult the last couple of years because they went with uh, six tournaments, and it sounds like this next year they're only going to have four. So it sure. um, makes it a little bit easier on our pocketbook. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's one of the things we have, too. I mean, when I started, um, you know, that was when the PWT was around, and I was fishing nine majors a year. And now it's down to the fact that NWT the last two years has been four. So it's it's one of those those things that Angler of the Year gets real tough when you're only fishing four events because you cannot afford to have even a mediocre event anymore sure. and have a chance at it. But, um, yeah, you know, so the rumor is that NWT might be going to five tournaments next year. I'm all for it. Um, I think the boat numbers will stay up if they go to, you know, five I'd like to see more than that, but obviously I'm, uh, you know, smart enough to realize that we need the boat numbers and we can't go too crazy with the amounts of tournaments. But uh, five tournaments will help. I just need to, uh, you know, be in the, about the top twenty in all five of them next year, and I think we should be fine. There you go. Well, good luck to you. I, you'll you'll get it. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. You betcha. So, what's your favorite way to fish walleye? Um, believe it or not, uh, you know, a lot of people will say you know, pitching jigs and things like that. I would say without a doubt, my favorite way to catch walleye is trolling lead court, um, which which is kind of a surprise to a lot of people, mainly because a, a lot of areas, especially over here, um, lead court is not that popular. And, and you know, Dad and Keith have won many tournaments doing a lot of different techniques. But, uh, you know, it, we're probably known more than anything for, for trolling and, and dive curves on crankbaits and things like that. And um, and lead core is just one of those types of lines that I think is the most versatile because you can fish lead core in five feet of water and you can fish lead core in 60 feet of water. And and quite frankly to me, uh, you know, with lead core, there's no stretch in it. And a lot of times they're running fire line leaders. Um, some of the most violent hits ever in trolling are on lead core. And, and I love when you have a rod just about snap in half when you have a nine-pounder <laughs> a lead core rod um and, and that's the cool thing i mean i am without a doubt a crankbait guy um love pulling crankbaits uh on any body of water we go to and the beauty about that lead core is a lot of times it doesn't matter what the water temperature is you can always match a style of bait on on what the action is for that time of year based on water temps and things like that and and many times those smaller, like number five flicker sheds and the smaller baits have a fantastic action for walleyes. And it's so tough to get them down and fish them effectively in 25, 30 feet of water. And I think that's where 
it's just something that I've always felt comfortable doing is contour trolling with wide core when some other guys might be moving slower and pulling bouncers in those situations or, or um, you know, vertical jigging on small areas. Um, but, yeah, surprisingly, lead core is, um, you know, I love to do it, man. If you gave me a lead core tournament every tournament, uh, I'd be a happy man. <laughs> yeah, well, and that, I was glad you said that because when I was talking with your dad, he had mentioned that. And that yeah. was something I really wanted to hit on because you're talking about fishing the lead core. And, um, you know, explain kind of your setup as far as you have for that with the fire line leader and how you go about doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and this will be, it, it, like I said, there's there's a lot of different ways to even pull lead core. But one of the, basically, I, I do it one specific way. And, and I, I'll pull lead core, I, I just talk about the situation first. Um, there's situations where we may be out on Lake Erie where we're fishing suspended fish where I need to get a bait down 30 feet, but I'm over 50 feet. Um, those are great situations where you can pull lead core and the setup's going to be different. But typically when I talk about pulling lead core, I mean on structure, on the bottom, and I'm running um, larger line counter reels and I put all 10 colors of lead on that reel. And, and that just goes back to being versatile. Like I said, you control it in 5 feet or you control it in 60 feet of water now. But I'll run a short fire line, like 10-pound fire line leader, about 15 feet in length, um, for the simple sake that now I can always read when my crankbait's working because I might be just kicking the bottom with it uh, with a small uh, shad-style bait. And you always want to know when you pick something up off the bottom. So that's where it's real important to have that fire line leader because there's no stretch in that fire line, too. Um, so you can basically just monitor your lure, and and then I'm what I'm doing is I'm graphing breaks way before I fish them and trying to figure out depth. But what Letcore allows you to do is you basically just speed up when you're going up the break and slow down when you're going down it. And with the same amount of line out, you literally can basically cover almost five to six feet um, of depth. You don't have to have that perfect amount of line out. You can just adjust it with the speed. Um, and, and, and that's pretty much what I'm doing. So I'm always trying to keep those baits real close to the bottom going in and out. And quite frankly, uh, you know, when you're on brakes that are tight, uh, you almost look like you're drunk when you're doing it correctly. <laughs> um, and, and that's one of the things, you know, Ron Seeloff, a big name from back in the day, he sure. passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was as good as anyone at contour trolling. And the joke was Ron always looked like a drunken sailor when he was trolling them. <laughs> He was all over the place. But I'll tell you what, that man knew exactly where his crankbaits are. And, and that's the key when you're trolling contours, uh, you know, with lead core, is you never need to worry about where your boat is. You need to always remember where your lures are. Um, so I'm not necessarily just saying, God, my boat needs to stay in 25 feet of water. Because if there's a point and I stay in 25 feet of water um, and swing around it, my baits are going to go up real shallow. So it's... Uh, it's kind of a feel thing. I would say that out of all the techniques in walleye fishing, I think being a good contour troller is one of the toughest things to learn um, just because it's always about keeping your baits in the zone. Sure. And, uh, and that's how I do it pretty much everywhere we go. Uh, short leaders, so you get more reaction on the lift and then on the drop with your speed changes. I always stay real, real short with those 15 feet. Uh, but you can pretty much run whatever bait you want then and see what they want. Now, when you're running those, you said the shad style baits, um, you know, what are you running as far as a lip on that? I mean, you're not running real deep divers, right? No. Um, you know, a lot of times the baits I'll run with, with, uh, lead core are just number five, uh, number six, number seven flicker shads. Um, very, very rarely. I mean, once in a while I'll run something, you know, in the lines of like a number nine flicker minnow or, or a deeper diving bait, but I would say 90%. I like those shad style baits, like the smaller flicker shads. And the reason being is, is time in and time out. Um, you know, there's a lot of baits that'll catch walleyes. Baits that have a lot of roll instead of a lot of wiggle to them. You basically they're rolling from top to bottom, which happen to be those shad style baits. Um, typically, uh, do the best pretty much all year long. Um, you know, as it gets warm, those deeper, wider action baits uh, get better. So you might need to change over in instances like this. But I can tell you this much. A number five flicker 
shad will catch fish all year long. And, and I've done it so much now that I just believe in it. Um, but th- those smaller baits, I think that's one of the things is I would never tell anyone that you have to run big baits to catch big walleyes because we've caught many, many 10-plus pound walleyes on number four and number five flicker sheds. It's all about matching the hatch, you know, matching the forage, and uh, and figuring out what profile the fish want in each system. And whether they're small or big, they'll typically eat it. Sure. Now, when you guys are running that lead core, now you said, you know, obviously going up and over contours, yep. uh, you know, the boat control, the speed and all that. But what are you, let's say you're starting out on a, a 15-foot break and you're running your lead cores. What do you find as far as speed goes to try and keep a number five down to where it needs to be? Yeah, I mean, that that's one of the things that you mess around with a little bit more than anything is, um, you know, I feel like uh, er, real early in the year, you know, after the ice is off and things like that, I'll troll much slower, obviously. And in the fall, I'll troll much slower, you know, maybe one two to one five. Um, but I, I'm one of the guys, uh, there's so many articles out there about speed trolling and going three miles an hour now and three and a half miles an hour. And just in my experiences, and this is one of the things that, you know, we talked about before, I've never seen where I've caught bigger and better fish going any faster than 2.4 miles an hour trolling crankbaits. I've, I've just personally never seen it. I've tried it, but I, I like that two-mile-an-hour zone um, for the majority of the year. Maybe it's 1.8, maybe it's 2.2, but I kind of keep it in that range a lot. And what I'll do when I start catching fish is then I'll keep bumping the speed up and bumping the speed up and going faster and faster and faster until I get to the point where I feel like I'm catching less fish because I'm going too fast. And for me, a lot of times that's 2.4, 2.5 miles an hour on the top side in the heat of the summer. Gotcha. So I, I tend to be a, a angler that might troll crankbaits a little bit slower than a lot of people. Um, you know, and I've had very good success throwing lead core uh, for the last 13 years in tournaments. Um, and whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but it's what I feel comfortable doing. Sure. Yeah. No, and that's all great information. Now, when you're running your spread, because you're not just running one or two of these. I mean, you're running upwards yeah. of six lines. Yeah, e- so. exactly. I mean, you know, it, the one thing is in our tournaments, um, our tournaments, no matter what state we go to, it's two rods. Uh, per angler, it, even if you can run three in that state. Obviously, like a state like Minnesota, we can only run one per person. So a lot of times we're running four flat lines with lead core on, and that can be a total train wreck. So what I'll do is I'll run two long rods out the sides of the boat, 10-footers, and then I'll run two shorter rods tipped up pretty much straight out the back corners. And when you tip those rods up and run them out the back corners, it keeps more lead up in the air, so all four of those baits aren't running side by side. Those two middle lines are running back quite a bit further than your flat line straight out to the side, so you don't get tangled up quite as much. Um, now, what I will say is it's very important when you're pulling four lead core lines to make sure that your crankbaits are tuned, because as soon as one picks up a stick, if they're not tuned, you're going to have a train wreck and a big ball of lead. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and see, that's what I was going to ask you because you're talking about running longer lines out or longer poles out to the side. So what, yep. what do you have for length on those 15? Uh, yeah, just, just 10 footers actually 10? I have. Um, you know, I've tried 12s before. Um, what I've found with a lot of the longer rods is they get softer and softer as they yeah. go up. Yeah. Um, so quite frankly, the 12 footers that I used to use, are giving me the same spread as the 10 footers I use right now because they're less, you know, the the 10 footers are a little bit stiffer, but they still have a soft tip. So I'm just using 10 footers out the sides. Um, you know, and the other thing that I saw with the longer rods, the 12 footers, some people are using up to 15 foot rods, is when there's more than a 10 mile an hour wind, it is tough to handle those things. Sure. Just bringing baits into the boat and things like that, things that are second nature now become very tough. Um, so I, I, I stay relatively short in my long rods, I guess you could say, and I run 10-footers. Now what are you running for your short rods? Yeah, I'll just run like 7.5-footers out the back. Some of the guys like the real shorties, you know, 4.5, 5-footers. Uh, there's a bunch of different models, but I'll still run 7.5-footers because I still want 
a nice, good, uh, soft tip on, on a rod. Uh, you know, especially with lead core and fire line, there's no give to them. And I just feel like those real short rods are just a tick too stiff. And I, I, I tried them. I lost more fish with them. So I stay with like seven and a half foot, you know, and I just use the, those bass pro Wella angler rods, um, that I've used for many, many years. Uh, but, uh, so I guess you could say my long rods are probably shorter than some guys' long rods, but my short rods are longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. So if that makes any sense. <laughs> oh, no, it does, because I can imagine, you know, and I'm sure that the people you fish with, obviously, in your in your tournaments, I mean, they, they have an idea of what they're doing to, or what you want to do as well. But, you know, I, my dad and I, we've ran the lead cores like that before. And like you said, I mean, we've had some horrendous train wrecks. <laughs> it's like, gosh. Oh, yeah. Man, how do you keep from doing this? But I mean, it's yeah, got to. You know, it's really, it's really a, as simple as uh, I probably pay more attention to what I'm doing when I'm trolling lead core than even when I'm like pitching jigs, which is kind of weird to think. Um, you know, because when when you're pitching jigs, the rod's in your hand. Um, but it's it's really paying attention when you got to make a sharp turn. Man, you make sure that your baits are running clean before you get there, and and you really pay attention because with those with that fire line on, you can see if those lines touch a little bit. But like I said, you know the the other thing you can do too is is just kind of mess around with those with those rods straight out the back. How much you tip them up? Um, if you tip them up a little bit more, all that's going to do is just get those baits running a little bit further back because there's going to be a little bit more lead out of the water. Um, but I, I, I would absolutely be lying to you if I said I don't get tangles. Uh, the, the key is, is when you get a tangle with lead core, you want to see it as quickly as you can see it. Yeah. <laughs> because if you miss it and you, all of a sudden it's they're tangled for 45 seconds before you realize it, that's when you may as well just get the scissors out and start cutting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that's pretty much how it is. So when I get tangled up, I try to see it right away. Um, and, and probably more than anything, I just pay a lot of attention. Well, and I think a lot of people have a misconception that, um, and I, when I say this, maybe not tournament anglers or, or hardcore fishermen, but that trolling is kind of a lazy man's way of fishing. But yeah, we, we, uh, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, in some ways it, it can be, you know, out in open water with planer boards, it's not too tough. Um, but, you know, contour trolling, uh, the guys that are really good at it, um, I probably sweat more than any technique when I'm doing that because you're constantly trying to turn the boat. A lot of times I'm working the kicker and the bow mount at the exact same time, uh, trying to stay exactly where I need my boat to be. And, and quite frankly, a lot of times I don't see what's going on around me too much when you're really focused in on, on trying to keep those lures where you need to be. Well, yeah, because if you end up getting anything on them, I mean, you're constantly, you know, making sure, like you said, they're running clean. If you do get something on them, you're bringing them in to, to clear them off. Now, I'm guessing with the, the lead core and the fire line makes it a lot easier to rip the weeds off. A lot easier. Yep. Yeah. Anything anything like that with no stretch, I mean, you can right away, if you see, see it pick a piece of grass up, you can rip them a lot. Um, and even when you have a lot of line out, just because there's no stretch in that whole system, um, sometimes you can see that that bait starts running clean. So it's not only just monitoring your lures, but it's also getting just real little pieces of debris off the lures um, if, if you run everything no stretch. You just got to be a little bit more careful when you're fighting big fish. Um, and it's just something you just got to take a little bit more time. Sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, that's perfect sense. I mean, and that's just it. I mean, when you're doing that stuff, you're hopping around from side to side, watching yeah. the boat. You know, I mean, there's yeah, quite a bit yeah. to it than just sitting I mean, there. I, I hop around like a spider monkey in my boat. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. It's, uh, it's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that's great. So now are your kids following in your footsteps? Uh, well, I mean, they love fishing. Uh, they're still young enough right now that... Uh, sure. You know, I don't take them out for more than 35, 40 minutes. Um, I, I hope that they're both doctors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have a feeling that, uh, you know, both of them will go out on, you know, my sister's pontoon or up by my old man on his pontoon. And, and they love fishing. So I have a feeling that uh, that there's a decent chance they'll, they'll want to possibly look into it. But, uh, 
You know, I think the key is, is I'm, I'm not going to force him to do anything, and Dad sure. never did to me. He let me play basketball, let me do everything that I wanted to do, um, and and I'm going to be the same way. I mean, sure, it would be great if I could, you know, do with them what, what uh, Dad and I are doing. We're still hanging out a long time after I was born, and and uh, I, I hope it's that way. Um, but you know, if, uh, if one of them wants to be an accountant, that's great. Um, what I'm just hoping for is they like it enough that in a few years I'm going to be able to run a few extra lines and, uh, <laughs> and, and at least have them enjoy it. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Well, that's awesome. So when are you going to get a chance to get out west and, you know, do some fishing out on the Columbia or someplace like I'm, that? I'm ready to come out there right now. I need to invite. <laughs> hey, you are more than welcome. I got the boat. I got the equipment. Let's go. <laughs> uh, we have talked. Uh, so much about coming out there, and I, I, w- I would absolutely love to, yes. Yeah, well, I, I think I was talking to your dad about it, and he was saying something that, you know, the logistics just haven't been there yet. Yeah, so. it's, you know, it, it's crazy when you think about, you know, going west. I mean, you guys are a long ways away from us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we, we, we'll go out to Fort Peck, and it's like a 20-hour drive, and it seems like you drove you know, like 87 hours, and that ain't even close. Right. <laughs> well, you're getting there. You're getting there. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things that they could, uh, you know, Keith been out there and he did the white sturgeon thing. Um, and uh, I, I, I definitely want to come out there, but, you know, now that, uh, now that I know you and uh, you just gave me the invite, I'm always going to remember that. I just have to book, I just have to book a flight, it sounds like. Heck Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was telling your dad, too, because, you know, obviously with, you know, certain sponsors and everything, I mean, you guys have to be careful how you do it. But, sure. um, you know, I know some of the dealers, too, that you guys, um, as, as far as Tracker goes, I mean, I was going to yeah, try and work yeah, on them I, and see what we could do. Exactly. I think, you know, a lot of the dealers have demo boats and stuff, and I think we could probably make it work. But, uh, no, I think that's something that, uh, you know, we always talk about it, and then it gets to be the middle of the summer and then we realize that uh we have as many shoots as what we do like right now left and then we uh panic a little bit so it's something <laughs> we just need to put on the slate and just schedule it early um we any one of us it'd probably be one of the things that uh that would be a show and we haven't done it in many many years where probably all three of us would be coming just because we all want to do it that would be so cool <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, and you know, even if it wasn't that way, uh, it's like I told the other two. Anytime you guys are interested, just let me know. We got the we got the hookup. I'm about that sounds, that sounds great. I appreciate it. Yeah, you betcha. We're about an hour and a half from you know some of the basically world record trophy oh, waters. So hey, you don't have to tell me. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, you guys seem spoiled out there. I all get. I keep seeing pictures of. 15 plus pounders and it just makes me want to puke <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll just get you out here and you have to take care of it yeah yeah that sounds great all right chase well i appreciate you taking the time um you know I, it's it's been great getting all three of you guys on uh that was kind of my goal when i started this was i wanted to get keith gary and you and it, it's just been a great perspective a great conversation and i appreciate you guys sharing all the information that you have yeah absolutely man just next time when you line all three of us up i don't need to be the last one <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding <laughs> uh, that's great and you know the other thing too is like i told them i said hopefully this won't be the last time well you know yep. we'll get you guys on and and talk some other techniques and whatnot and see how the tournaments are going now let everybody know how they can find you yeah um you know i, I one of the things that we do obviously we all stay uh, very steady with the social media stuff. Um, you know, my professional page is just Chase Parsons. Um, and obviously the Next Bite TV, we have a, a Facebook page, and it's just the Next Bite TV. Um, and then our show uh, will begin airing again uh, early in, uh, in January, coming up here um, for the new shows on NBC Sports and Discovery Channel's Destination America. But... Uh, Social media is always a good way. Anyone have any specific questions about techniques? I know all three of us, um, you know, in all of our professional pages are just our names. 
uh, we're more than willing to answer any questions that anyone might have. Well, again, thank you, Chase, and it's been great talking with you. That sounds great. Thanks for having me, Lonnie.